thank you so much, Vanessa, and thank you very much um, to all of you for coming. I'm going to do this in voice, but if anyone has questions or if you can't hear me when I'm talking, please, um, please feel free to, to write a question or send a chat. Can everyone hear me now? Great. Uh, so this is my very first afternoon in Second Life. Forgive me, I'm still figuring out how to navigate and um, and I'm sort of awestruck and totally excited to, to be here at Medici University. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, and I thought today I would talk about some of the projects that I don't get to talk about very often and some of uh, some of the work that isn't available online as much, um, as well as a couple of, of recent projects. So if we could have the next slide. Thank you. I, um, this is a self-portrait of me sitting on a small portion of my books. I'm a bibliophile. I have about 1,000 books, and um, that, I think, is emblematic of uh, a, a condition that I have that I don't know what it's called, but I'm obsessed with information to the point where I get uh, complete information overload. But to that effect, I, I work in many different ways. I'm a video and performance artist, but I also like to collaborate and um, I do some writing, I do curating, I do, um, I, I run a project space in my backyard in Los Angeles. Can we have the next slide? And I think of all of these roles as part of my overall artistic identity. I have lived in Los Angeles for the last 25 years and I went to UCLA in Los Angeles for both um, for both undergrad and graduate school. I studied new genres and uh, I'm currently a professor at a university in Orange County. I teach video and performance and contemporary practice there. Um, but I work a lot online and I'm sort of embarrassed to say that I, I work online doing social media and stuff. It's funny for me to be saying that to a group here when I'm sure you are all much, uh, are, are far, far more experts at the virtual realm than I am. But social media has been a very important platform for my projects for the last few years and I'll talk a little bit about some of those projects. Um, if you want to learn more about my work, I keep a lot of uh, boards on Pinterest that are kind of like bookmarks or resource pages for the various facets of my practice that I'm interested in. So um, feminism, education, collaboration. I'm also doing some, some research right now on nudity as a radical political act. So there's a lot of... Um, there's a lot of books on Pinterest under my account. I also use Facebook to aggregate and collect information about um, about other artists, but also to coordinate projects. Um, and I have a few different Facebook pages for my current projects. The Situation Room is a project space that I'm running that functions a little bit like a gallery. Uh, gallery Tally is a collaborative project involving um, the production of posters that represent gender inequity in the art world. And uh, I have uh, my own artist page on Facebook, but I'm not that great at keeping it up. Um, can we go to the next slide? All of my current projects have been very collaborative and open to the public, so if there's any projects that I talk about that you see that you'd be interested in participating in, I would heartily welcome any new collaborators or participants. Um, some of the projects exist online only, and some of them have uh, real-life components to them. Um, next slide, please.
the the theme that I wanted to talk about today in in my work is the idea of gifting or generosity, and hopefully talk a little bit about how that relates to notions of feminism. Um, I've been thinking a lot about how to construct a feminist artistic practice as an antidote to the very hierarchical, patriarchal, capitalist system that it seems to be surrounding us. Um, and I'm, I'm very interested in art as an idea of exchange, as a way to provide an alternative economy to capitalism, um, a way to barter experiences and knowledge. Um, and I've been I've been thinking about the, my role within the contemporary art world and I, I've made objects, I've made paintings and installations and things, but not, I don't think that I'm very good at that and I, I think that my skills lie much more in doing collaborative projects, creating artist collectives and doing projects that are crowdsourced and employing social media to get them done. Um, can we move to the next? To actually go two slides ahead, please. So, so briefly, before I talk specifically about the projects that I've done that involve gifting and generosity, I wanted to tell you what the Situation Room is. Um, and it is a, a small gallery space that I created in my garage, in my backyard. And it is, it's a project space that is designed to be a resource for local artists. So it is, um, I don't run it like a gallery where I curate and put on exhibitions and sell work. I, I make this space available to people who would like to submit proposals and do projects. And it's a completely nonprofit space. So I also provide um, some resources, I have equipment like video cameras or um, projectors and a giant printer, certain things that I think are difficult to get a hold of if you're not in school or if you don't work for a tech company, for example. So artists are welcome to come and use equipment there or to have meetings or do projects or video screenings. The image that you're looking at right now is an uh, image of a reception in the evening, the opening reception, and I had a a video screening of feminist videos from around the world. So I had um, 55 videos from women artists from all over the world that were on view at the Situation Room. And um, after that opened in February, and after that, I've received proposals that have, um, we've now got the Situation Room booked until the end of the year. We're actually having an opening of an exhibition today by a collective of artists called Patient Experience. And this collective, uh, is a group of artists who all have very serious illnesses and are making work about being seriously ill. And um, so, so I I tend to use this. I reserve this space for for people who are local or who can be on site to run the exhibition or the programming while they're here. But I do. Uh, do do um, webcasts and video programming sometimes as well. So please keep it in mind um, and keep a keep an eye on the Situation Room Facebook page because I put calls for participation there as well as the schedule of events. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? The other project that I'm currently working on that I would love for any of you to be involved with um, is called the Gallery Tally Poster Project. And this is a project that began in the end of 2013. And uh, I had been counting numbers of male and female artists that I saw in the art world, either represented in contemporary galleries or represented in magazines. Um, and in the advertisements for artists in top art magazines, and I was realizing over and over that the, the ratio of male artists represented was far greater than that of female artists. And I started asking people uh, in my immediate community if they had any numbers, if they knew what the ratios of male and female representation were, and everybody 
everybody knew that it wasn't balanced, but nobody knew what the numbers were. So I started counting. And I, I developed a, a database of, of statistics on using Google Docs. And I began tallying the numbers of artists represented in galleries in Los Angeles and New York initially. And then I began inviting artists to help me visualize those statistics in the form of posters. Can we go to the next slide? And within six months, I had 200 people participating in making posters that visualize the ratios of male and female artists at individual galleries. And the project now has almost 2,000 people involved. I've done it, I've, I've organized it all through the Facebook page. And we've now had six exhibitions in real life. So all of the posters are two by three feet or approximately a meter uh, tall and a uh, half a meter wide. Um, there are 400 physical posters and that number is constantly growing as well. And um, currently the posters are on view in Chicago. We've had exhibitions of the posters in Puerto Rico and La Angeles in Orange County and Irvine and they're going to Santiago Chile in the fall and Santa Fe New Mexico in the fall I haven't had any exhibitions of them in Europe yet but I hope to soon um, there are about 26 cities that we've tallied percentages for and uh, I guess the project is currently mentioned in the in the current issue of art news the women's issue of Art News Magazine uh, has a story about numbers in the art world. Um, so, so please check it out. There's, um, there's also a Tumblr page for Gallery Tally where you can see all the posters individually. And it's just ongoing, hopefully, until it begins to make a difference. Um, but this is a good example of the way that I like to work collaboratively, where there is an overarching idea, and I invite people to participate, but each individual who participates can bring his or her own style to the to their poster. So the project is also functioning as a repository of, of contemporary artists, so people can look at the project and see the work or the style or the contributions of now hundreds of from around the world and each of these artists have identified themselves as being artists who are concerned with um, gender equity and and representation in the art world um, can we go to the next slide please so recently you probably heard about the the sale of that Picasso painting for about I think it was hundred and seventy nine million dollars um, which, well, of, of course, there has never been that high of a sale of a work by a woman artist. But also, I, I've been thinking a lot about the way that art is valued and what that means and what it means for a single object or work of art to be worth $179 million. <laughs> and and what, what else we could do with money like that. And I'm very conflicted because I want, I want the world to value art and cultural production, but I also want that value to be a little bit more evenly distributed. Um, I think if you threw $179 million into the American education system, that's probably more money than our government spends on education in a year, uh, for example. So I think a lot about what my role is in this in this art market and um, and what I do with my bo my female body in this very patriarchal capitalist art world. Can we have the next slide? Um, I have been teaching as a professor of art for about fifteen years now, and Vanessa, can we switch slides? I don't know. Thank you. Um, and I find that the longer I teach and the more I make work and the more that I see the art world, the, the less I the less I feel like I know. I think you know it's the classic the more you uh, the more you know, the more you know how much you don't know. And uh, with, with the, the increasing rise and integration of the internet in, in the 
classroom and in teaching, it has really shifted the way that I teach and therefore the way that I think about the presentation of information and the way that I think about my work as well. And in in response to some of these considerations, I, I, I created a performance called Body of Knowledge. And um, I just performed Body of Knowledge a week, a week ago in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Um, and in 2012, I performed it in Berlin. And Body of Knowledge is a performance in which I recite everything that I know until my mind or body collapses. Um, the first time I did the performance, it took me 23 hours, and the second time I did the performance, I actually picked out in, after 20 hours. So this is an image of the performance in Buenos Aires, and if we can go to the next slide, that next image is uh, the image of the performance in Berlin. And, and, and this piece also came about because for a while I had um, I would have students who would ask me all kinds of random questions and on several occasions people would say things to me uh, that were something like, well, I thought I would ask you because you're faster than Google, <laughs> which I thought was an incredible compliment. Um, probably not true, but, but uh, something that I was really proud <laughs> to, to hear from people. Um, I don't think that's any longer true. I don't think people, I haven't heard that from students in a while, but I started thinking about the relationship between the mind and the body and the internet and what does it mean to have this um, kind of vast body of knowledge in your brain and how does it come out in artworks or in lectures um, and how is information organized and what does it mean to know something and what is the relationship between your body and what you know. Uh, and, and is there a difference between the things that you feel or the things that you think or the things that you've heard about versus the things that you know? Um, so it was, it was a piece about what I call somatic epistemology, which is the kind of the, the derivation of knowledge through the body. And, um, and it presents a really interesting challenge also if you think about how you would recite everything that you know, how do you organize that information? Does it, does it come out just by uh, whatever occurs to you or do you think of a system in which you can disseminate the information? Um, the first time I did it, I didn't think about it at all and I just said whatever came to mind. The second time I did it, I... Um, decided that I would let my environment dictate what I knew and that I would recite things that I knew based on prompts, my visual prompts from my environment. So I would look at the street and talk about what I knew about uh, the street or watch birds flying by and talk about that or, um, or I would respond to people in the area uh, and, and just let my brain go on these sort of uh, tangents or trains of thought that, that it occurred to me were very much like surfing the internet and going on all of these tangents through hyperlinks um, and, and associative uh, correlations. Can we go to the next slide, please? So there's something about gifts that is interesting because I think often we consider gifts as an obligation, you're supposed to give a gift at a wedding or at a birthday or um, on a special occasion, and sometimes you give a gift because you actually want something back from that person or you want them to think that you are generous or you want them to give you a gift in return or, you know, there's always something that comes attached with it. It's sort of a, um, it's, it's much more of a negotiation or an exchange or a strategic tool than it is just um, an empirical gift. And it's, it's never that straightforward. Um, but, but I like the idea of art as capital and art as a commodity. And, and I also like the idea of the artist as a kind of a medium or a conduit something. The images on, on the screen right now are images of uh, Shaker gift drawings and the Shakers were a cult in the United States that I guess, I'm not sure when they started, I, I think they're, they're pretty old, 1700s, late 1700s, early 1800s. 
uh, old by American standards anyway. Um, and, and gift drawings were drawings the Shakers made after receiving kind of divine inspiration. So it wasn't that the drawings were a gift, it's that the artist was receiving the gift of truth or the gift of information from a higher power and then was translating that information into these drawings. And the drawings are incredibly abstract and radical for the time. I mean, it, it wasn't really until the 1940s that American, the American art world saw um, abstraction. So I think it's pretty radical that in the 18th century, these artists were creating these these abstract diagrammatic drawings as a result of receiving knowledge from some undescribed higher power. Um, and that got me thinking about the artist as, as a conduit for information or a psychic or spiritual medium, um, as well as the idea of artwork as, as a gift. Um, it's, it's certainly the first gift that a child gives to their parents, or maybe among the first, where a child will make a drawing and give it to their parents as a present. Like, look, mom, look what I made you. Uh, which uh, the parent likes because it is something from the child, but if you look at the drawing, it's usually um, probably not something that someone would save for a long time. Um, can we go to the next slide? So I like to think about what it means for art, contemporary art, to be a gift. And, and when I walk around galleries or art fairs and I, I look at the art and I think about whether each piece is a gift to me or if it's, or if it's uh, like, I don't know what's the opposite of gift, like the, an, an evil present or something that uh, you don't want, the anti-gift. Um, the... I, I did a project at a, at a museum in Pasadena <laughs> near, yeah, fruitcake is totally the anti-gift, you're right. <laughs> I did a project in, um, in Pasadena where I was giving a lecture about the idea of cuteness. I think cute is like an aesthetic gift, like looking at cute animals is sort of a visual gift. <laughs> Um, and we see that on the internet all the time, right? If you think about uh, cat videos, or cute animal videos, um, and so, so in the f what you're looking at now is me at uh, giving a lecture at the Pasadena Armory. I'm in the mid the mid ground, but in the foreground is a pile of presents, um, and in the very background is. A, is my lecture about cute. I was giving a lecture on the history and theory of cute. And if we can go to the next slide, you can see the pile of presents as I was making them uh, before the lecture. I had a team of, yeah, cuteology. Um, it's actually, there is actually an intellectual, cat, I guess, um, research category called affect theory that cute falls into, and it's, um, there, there are not that many cute experts in the world. I'm aspiring to be one of them, but I'm, I'm a couple people behind. Uh, there's a woman at Stanford who, who wrote a really great book on cute. Her name is Sian Ngai. Um, affect theory looks at things like, uh, at phenomena like cuteness or, um, coolness or things that are interesting or things that are boring. I mean, I think it was um, not Hegel Heidegger who wrote about boredom, right? I think he wrote there's like seven or ten layers of boredom. Um, but if you think about trying to describe what is interesting or what is cool, it's a, it's kind of it's pretty evasive, right? It's an interesting thing to try to pin down. Anyway, I for this lecture at the Armory, I have assistants working. With me and for every minute of the lecture, it was a um, a sixty minute lecture. For every minute of the lecture, uh, one of my assistants would deliver a gift to someone in the audience, and the gifts were all things that I thought artists would like. Uh, they were small, um, and they weren't necessarily monetarily valuable, but they were things that I thought would be would be valuable in some way. So. Uh, 
where I had plants, I had sm uh, uh, small artworks, I had art supplies, uh, there was some candy or, or food things that were yummy to eat. Um, and then I wrapped them in varying sizes, bo size boxes with all different kinds of paper because I think there's something really thrilling about getting just getting a gift for no reason or getting a gift uh, that is a surprise. And there were all kinds of uncanny circumstances that happened. So uh, the person that got the cactus, for example, um, I was worried that someone might get the wrong message from give me giving them a cactus because they're prickly. But it turns out that the person who got the cactus was a cactus fanatic and had a cactus garden at home and was delighted to have another cactus. And, and there's no way I could have known that. It was just serendipity. Um, if we can go to the next page, please. You can see the my assistants who are giving out the gifts. Um, and I, and I, I actually try to bring gifts whenever I give a lecture in real life, and I was feeling kind of bad that in this lecture I don't know how to give gifts out in Second Life. That'll, I'll have to learn how to figure that out and um, do it on my next lecture. But I usually try to bring something, um, either like feminist swag or, um, I don't know, there's, there's a whole slew of little presents that I bring. Sometimes I bring posters, sometimes I bring pencils, sometimes... Um, it's, it's other things. Next slide, please. At the same time as I was giving this lecture, I, I had convinced the museum to let me bring a petting zoo into the museum uh, so everyone could pet cute animals while listening to my talk. Um, yeah, I should give out unicorn t-shirts. I don't happen to have any t-shirts. I have feminist t-shirts, but not unicorn t-shirts. Um, that's a good idea. So here are some, some kids petting the chickens. You can see there's an alpaca in the background. Um, I thought it was pretty exciting to have animals for people to pet. I, I did get harassed by PETA, who was very upset and thought that it was um, cruel and unusual punishment to have a petting zoo in existence at all. So that was actually a little stressful and got me kind of thinking about um, the sensitivity, I think, of, of using animals in, in any way, any public way, really. Um, go to the next slide, please. The, there's, there's something that happens when we look at animals or other human beings that's um, a reaction in our brain as a result of mirror neurons and when we see someone smiling or frowning or scowling we tend to consciously respond in the same way uh, and I and I think uh, acute animals for the most part because they look like they need you they look like they are wanting you and loving you and they're vulnerable they tend to soften people's demeanor when they come to them so I like the idea that people would be um, kind of soothed and calmed while visiting with cute animals in the museum. I've also, I also kind of love the fact that you can be in the fanciest gallery or the most prestigious museum and if someone were to put a kitten or a puppy in the middle of the room, everyone would pay more attention to that creature than to any of the artworks <laughs> around. And that's, that's really fascinating. To me, I mean, maybe it's simplistic. I don't know, but um, I think for as, as much as we have cultivated this kind of incredibly long um, history of art and semiotic and art theory, uh, acute animal can trump that in a matter of seconds, um, and I find that pretty fascinating. Can we go to the next project, please? Uh, I turned 40 in, in 2012, and so I was thinking about what that meant and the stigmas of age, um, and, and I was invited to be a part of, I was invited to be a part of a project by a Los Angeles-based artist named Susan Silton, and, and in summary, a component of her project was to have, uh, several different artists give a five-minute presentation about their work at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles. 
and and I thought I I didn't know how to talk about my work in five minutes and that seemed impossible and silly so instead I thought I would use those five minutes um, to give away 40 of my most valued possessions one for each year of my life and uh, I gave a very quick talk just identifying what those four things were. And then I let everyone know that um, randomly throughout the audience there were envelopes placed under, cha under, under chairs in the auditorium. And in the envelope was a photograph of one of the 40 objects and a certificate that stated that the bearer of that certificate would be the owner of that object um, whenever I died. Uh, and, and so it, it was a little bit of a conundrum because if it was something that people wanted, they, they had to kind of secretly wish for me to die sooner. <laughs> but it was also um, the, the image and the certificate themselves were the artwork, uh, in a sense. So if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, so it got me thinking about what it meant, what it what it means to turn kind of personal objects or everyday objects into artworks. Um, I was thinking about how emotional value translates to capital uh, value or economic value, um, and I was thinking about how personal personal meaning um, is introduced into artworks. So some of the things I gave away were like, uh, this is um, a portion of my collection of feminist books. As I mentioned before, I have a lot of books, so that was a hard one for me to part with. Um, next slide, please. I gave away things like my car, because um, I live in Southern California where I drive like uh, between 80 and 100 miles a day. My car is really valuable to me. However, it's also 15 years old and has 300,000 miles on it, so it's probably not very valuable to anybody else. Um, this is an image of uh, the church where my studio is, so I gave away my studio lease to someone. I've had my studio there also for about 15 years, and it's, I think, the cheapest studio in Los Angeles, so that's pretty valuable. Next slide, please. Um, uh, I gave away, I have a collection of artist books that I gave away, I have some jewelry that I gave away. I mean, most of my possessions are not really that, mon like, they're not about monetary wealth as much as they are about sentimental wealth. Um, this one is a, the next slide is an image of just the um, ones and zeros. I gave away a couple of hard drives that have, like, my entire library of uh, art images. So, in a sense, that's, like, my home, all, my whole art practice was given away on one of the one of the drives next slide please and some really weird things started happening because some of the people in the audience were people that I knew in the art world and see again and again and for example this one one guy received the a ring it was my mother's ring, and my mother died when she when I was 19, and then I've worn this ring ever since. It's a very simple silver ring, uh, but every time I would see the guy that got it, he would like ask for my hand and want to see the ring. He's like, "Are you?" Um, he would he would ask if you know how was his ring doing, and was I still wearing it, and was it still okay? Which was so crazy. Um, as far the, someone asked if I was um, giving away a copy or, or did I lose the images. It's the original drive, but the person doesn't get it until I die. Uh, so they'll get it, the whole thing, um, but they have to wait until I die. Uh, and and it, it all started really weird family politics. Like my sister was in the audience and she got... Um, she got my collection of uh, artist books, like original artist books. I have a lot of kind of handmade individual artist books. But I think she really wanted like my collection of feminist books instead or something else. Uh, 
And so I told people in the audience that if they wanted to barter with someone else who got something else, that they could also do that. And that happened a little bit after the after the lecture. Um, this is a, a vase that some students gave to me that was really meaningful. It's a it's Venetian glass, but it also looks very vaginal, so I love that. Next slide, please. Um, so I think it's, it's interesting and weird when people become reduced to their material objects. Um, and then some people like actually got the things that they really wanted. And it's weird to have strangers wanting things of yours, <laughs> like things that are really emotional. This image that's coming up now is an image of my uh, the sticker album that I had from fifth grade, which I still have, believe it or not. So this is a, a vintage stickers from the early 1980s. Priceless. Next image, please. Uh, when I was in high school, I wore a giant oversized jean jacket, and on the inside of the jean jacket, uh, for the course of a year or two, I would use Sharpies to inscribe lyrics and poems. So you know how teenagers, I think, are, are, can get pretty uh, emo and um, dramatic, and so this is like this incredible record of my emotional teenage years. So that's the inside of a jean jacket with like all kinds of lyrics from like... Depeche Mode and The Cure and, I don't know, uh, Bob Dylan, probably. <laughs> um, I know, the sticker back is one of my favorites. It was hard to let go. I can't remember who has it, uh, but if, if I remember, you could, you could, like, maybe barter them for something else. Um, next slide, please. Uh, the last one in this series that I'll show you is a... Um, it's a, a print that Judy Chicago gave to me uh, because I worked on a catalog essay for one of her exhibitions and I drove to New Mexico to visit with her and do interviews um, and so she gave me uh, a print and then signed it. Um, next slide please. The next series of works I wanted to talk about, and I'll try to move a little bit more quickly, is um, from an exhibition called Reverse Engineering. And it's an exhibition that I did after coming out of a really severe uh, depression, like a completely debilitating depression where I was basically in bed for like a year. Um, and and this, this show, uh, I kind of turned my depression into work. Uh, and, it, and it was... It was catalyzed by a breakup, but it was it was really much more about like maybe a midlife crisis um, that the breakup was just kind of the last straw. So uh, these are two CDs, and um, they were copies of uh, these CDs of like uh, love songs and breakup songs that I had made for the person that I was breaking up with, like, again, like, really overly emotional and romantic and dramatic, um, and one CD was, uh, really, um, pessimistic, like, it's over and I'm dying and it's, it's awful, uh, and then the other CD was, um, uh, like, optimistic, like, I'm coming out of it, like, I'm, I don't need you anymore, life is better without you, that kind of stuff. And so I made I an infinite number of copies of these CDs uh, that people could take with them when they came to the, came to the exhibition, so sort of like a Felix Gonzalez Torres poster, everyone could take copies of this, these CDs and kind of live through my emotional journey through these um, curated songs. Next slide, please. I also did a um, part of this exhibition was a project called it was actually called I would do anything for you um, and I and I put vinyl on the wall in my in my um, handwriting that says I am here for you and, and that was uh, something that I think I've, he I've heard and said a lot in relationships where someone will say like, oh, it's okay, honey, I, like, I'm here for you. Uh, and what does that mean? 
Uh, what does it mean to be there for someone? What does it mean when you feel like someone's not there for you? And so I, I, I converted that, this, this questioning of being there for someone into a performance piece in which I offered my time in four or blocks to women artists who needed help with something and I would offer help them with anything they wanted within those four hours. Um, it, it couldn't be something that cost me money, uh, but I would do any kind of labor or temporal activity that they wanted. Um, and I have some images of that a little bit later. Can we have the next slide, please? In a related piece, I did a performance for the opening of this exhibition called We Would Do Anything For You. And this is a collaborative performance in which I had um, 17, I had 17 women joining me and they stood throughout the gallery during the three hours of the opening and each of us held a single smile for three hours straight. And if you can imagine what happens after you hold a smile for even an hour, you begin to drool and your, and your face might kind of twitch a little bit and the smile that looked welcoming and accommodating initially begins to look a little bit crazy or hysterical. Um, and, and, it, and the piece was meant to, to be about the way that women are expected to be hostesses or they're expected to be accommodating or um, pleasant to look at. And the thing that was really funny, we can go through the, um, the next three slides just in succession. There are some images of the gallery opening. The thing that was funny is that people would walk into the space and you didn't know right away that, that people were performing. There were just women throughout the space holding a smile. Um, unflinchingly holding a smile. So it took a minute for people to walk in and kind of figure out that something was going on and that something weird was going on. And, and due to the aforementioned mirror neurons, people would walk in and immediately kind of start smiling because there are all these women smiling at them. Uh, and then, they, then they, that smile and that pleasant feeling would kind of turn to discomfort and, and disease as they realized that uh, these women were not stopping smiling and I was thinking a lot about like this 1950s idea of the housewife always being a happy hostess and the idea of uh, the introduction of um, Prozac and antidepressants becoming really pervasive in the 80s and 90s and much more common uh, for women to be taking them than for men we can actually just yeah as soon as these come up we can keep going that's me in the kind of green shirt in the back um, and that was my dog Klaus sitting in my lap in that previous picture, Piedra. Klaus is sitting on the floor here with me right now and he has one of those horrible collars because he has an abscess on his butt. <laughs> Hi Klaus! Yeah. So I did this smile piece like, um, once before in 2009 in an exhibition that was in a house. Uh, so that was even more appropriate. Um, so people would would come into the this house setting that was a gallery, and then these women were all sitting or standing around, standing or sitting around, smiling. Um, the image that's about to come up, I think, is a series of close-ups of me and two of the other performers with a smile. You can see uh, the woman on the right. There's a stream of drool starting to fall off her chin because she's been smiling for so long. Uh, it's turned into a drool. Next slide, please. So this, um, I had wall text up in the gallery that, that announced to people that I was available to help them. Um, and I was available to help women artists because I, I wanted to show solidarity and I wanted to show support rather than competition. I think in the art world, um, people are so often competitive with each other to, and it's to everybody's detriment. Um, I think within feminism, one of the things we battle with the most is, is women undermining other women. Um, so I wanted to present a gesture of solidarity and support and say, 
you know, I'm here to help you with whatever you need. Um, we can go to the next four slides, please. And, and people signed up to do for all kinds of really amazing things. So one woman who is a writer and a poet and an activist asked me to help her, um, asked me to help her organize all of her activities. This is her house and then one of her typewriters. I took pictures of uh, all of the things that I did with people as I did them so I could um, document and share it with, with other people online. Um, they, I guess I didn't bring too many images of, of this project, but in her studio and someone else wanted me to help her promote her new film. Um, another woman just wanted me to have lunch with her and it turned out I was having lunch with her on the anniversary of her mother's, no, it was, on, it was her mother's birthday, but her mother had recently died and she just wanted to sit and talk about and honor her mother. Um, it was really amazing. Like people were incredibly generous. And, and one of the things that I've found through doing projects that are about gifting or generosity is that the generosity is returned exponentially. Um, and people are incredibly amazing and wonderful in that way. Um, next slide, please. Uh, another project that I did that involved um, generosity was this, I was, I was invited to be the artist in residence on someone's Facebook page. And she, Chloe Flores is a, a curator in Los Angeles and for two years she like basically shopped out her Facebook page um, as a, a virtual site for residency. So we can go um, to the next two pictures, please. And so each month, a different artist would become Chloe Flores and could use her Facebook page however they wanted. And I did three different things for the month that I was there. Um, for one thing, each time someone liked something that I did, uh, I would post a picture of a cute animal on their Facebook wall. So um, that was my, my gift of cute in, in, um, in reaction to their gift of liking my stuff. The other thing I did is that each day I posted a portion a portion of a larger photograph and it was one of my artworks. And for people that were following me each day, if they were to collect each of these thumbnails and put them together uh, to complete the image, the first person that sent me the completed image would get an original print mailed to them. This was one of the cute animals. Wow, we can go to the next slide, please. Um, I actually did four things, I guess. So the third thing I did um, was to invite people to find everyday vaginas and post them on my page. I'm going to wait until this comes up. So this is this is a small, what you're looking on the screen right now is a small portion of a larger image. I'm sorry to say I didn't give you the full image in this slideshow, which was probably kind of dumb. Um, but it's an image of, well, if you figure it out, let me know. I'll send you a print of it. You'll have to do some research on the uh, on my website. Uh, next image, please. So, in terms of the everyday vaginas, I got really interested in thinking about how many phallic images are out there, and um, and I wanted to see uh, more more vulvar images or more feminine images rather than this just per perpetual series of. Um, things that were, reminded me of the patriarchy. So uh, if you think about telephone poles or skyscrapers or anything that's like a pole or anything that's vertical, um, we kind of have these masculine associations and we do not have really comfortable associations with, with uh, the female form. And I just started thinking that if that form was more common and more pervasive and more embraced, uh, the idea of the feminine might have more power or more cultural agency. We can go through the next um, one, two, three, like like seven or ten images, just just as they come up. These are just examples of images 
that people gave to me. So this is an example of like, if I presented gifts online for people, they would come back with gifts uh, of images and vagina images. And it was pretty amazing actually to see how many people got on board with this. And, and I, it was kind of a secret agenda because in asking for this, I'm also basically putting this idea in the minds of everybody who's reading my posts. Um, I'm, I'm putting it in their head to look for female forms out in the world. And whether they posted it on my page or not, I, I could have, have a fair amount of confidence that at least it was in their mind <laughs> as they were out and about. And, and sure enough, I got some, some contributions from some really interesting people. And it was, it was uh, male and female contributors alike and, and even a couple of um, kind of high up administrators or curators who I never would have expected would have participated. Uh, and I just, I love the idea that people were walking around the world thinking about um, my, my Facebook residency and uh, looking for vag vaginal images. <coughs> I also was interested in trying to presents an antidote to the discomfort with vaginal forms that we have, and that's something that I've dealt with a lot of my recent work too. Um, looking back to the 1970s ideas of consciousness raising groups where women would look at, sit around and, and uh, with mirrors would look at their own vaginas and describe and talk about what they were seeing and share that experience with each other. Um, throughout the 20th century, it was common for women to not look at themselves at all, and some women often like relied simply on a doctor telling them what they look like. So I think it's just it's amazing for me to think that there like you, there's there's a part of your body that you don't know what it looks like. Um, I'm going overtime as I usually do. Are we okay to keep going for a little bit? Okay, treasure hunts. This was one of my favorite part of the Facebook residency. Uh, so each, um, every day for the month that I was in residence on Facebook, I would put a little gift in a local store or a gallery. So somewhere that was, I was trying to support independent and local business and local projects. So I would put little presents and, and they would all say Chloe Flores. So we can go through the next five images, please. Um, and I would give a clue. Uh, I would give a clue about uh, where that location was and who the first person to figure out the location and go to the space could have the present. Um, so it was also a way for me to get people in my Facebook community or people in the arts community to patronize local businesses or local galleries or other art spaces. So it was a sort of exchange um, and then people were rewarded for, for going out and um, visiting these places. I'm actually almost done with the gift projects, and then there's I can we can do questions, and and uh, I have a few extra things if there's time. Uh, another project I did on on Facebook in, starting in 2013, which was maybe the beginning of, of this this series of Facebook collaborations that I've been doing, was uh, I, I became really interested. Um, in, in Mary Wollstonecraft's book, The Vindication of the Rights of Women, which is, uh, by some accounts, kind of the first feminist text. And, um, and I had never read it. Like, I do a lot of feminist work, but I wasn't trained as a feminist in school. And I'm just, I'm playing catch up. Uh, and I'm sort of a feminist, auto, I'm, a, I'm an auto feminist, like I'm a self-taught feminist, and I'm learning as I go. And so I was reading, I started reading this, this book and it was but it was really tricky and I and I realized that for me to read out loud is I I sometimes learn better when I read out loud to myself um, and I don't remember exactly how I came uh, how I made that jump but I wanted 
I wanted to invite other people to read it too. And so each week I would post, I would transcribe and post a section of the book on Facebook and ask for, for people to be contributors um, by creating a reading of that section. And then I created this Exquisite Corpse video that was a whole sequence of people from around the world reading this, like sections from this book. Uh, and it was amazing because people would do these really incredible performative um, videos. We can go through the next uh, five slides, please. So one person um, played out, read their section using sock puppets, and someone else um, read their section with a cat, and someone else had these really crazy filters on their video, and uh, someone else like created a whole character and read it in this really sultry voice, and someone else created this like uh, video um, like portal that, that you were just kind of traveling through this portal as she read to you. And so it became this really amazing collaborative work as people were interpreting this text from 1792 uh, in, in 2012 or 2013. I was also interested in the fact that I was born in 1972 and 1792 is a nice transposition of those numbers. It, it, it gave me some excuse to feel closer to Mary Wollstonecraft as a result of some sort of quack numerology, perhaps. Um, so the um, uh, I wanted to let's see, is this it? Yeah, this piece that's about to come up on screen is it's a piece called Barbara, which is named after my mother, and it's me the favorite favorite object I've ever made and Barbara is a giant crystal vagina embedded into the wall and uh, it's five and a half feet tall for a while I was making all of these artworks about vaginal forms that were that were my height so um, it was five and a half feet tall and it was about two feet deep so it went into the wall it was sort of like a cave or a geode you can see on the right a detail of some of the crystals. I traveled to Arkansas looking for uh, quartz crystals because Arkansas is the quartz crystal capital of North America. So Arkansas and China are the two places that um, that are that that have the most quartz crystals that are exported and sold. So I went to Arkansas and I bought 300 pounds of quartz crystals and I constructed this crystal vagina that was also a fountain and it poured out um, pina colada. Yeah, it looks a little bit phallic in the images, but it did not, right, the, the crystals themselves were phallic, you're totally right, that's, a, that's an interesting point. Um, the macro, the bigger picture was a very vaginal, um, and it was a fountain that poured out pina colada cocktails. So there was a, you can see there's like a shag carpet on the Floor and people would come in <laughs> and kneel on the carpet in front of the fountain and fill their glasses with this intoxicating milky liquid. Um, next slide, please. You can see a close-up of the fountain. And uh, I, I made the drinks a little bit stronger than I meant to, and, and which actually ended up being a good thing because everyone got really tipsy <laughs> and they kept wanting to come back <laughs> to the crystal vagina and refill their glasses. <laughs> Um, and it was pretty much like one of the happiest, best exhibition openings I've ever had. Like everyone was like delighted and they were all tipsy and they were all like gathering around the giant vagina. <laughs> it was really satisfying, I have to say. Um, next, one more, let's go to the, I'll talk about. I guess two more. I have two more projects that are about gifting or exchange, and then maybe we can do a conversation or a um, Q and A. Uh, the this upcoming project is a piece called "Love Thy Neighbor," and it's a performance that I did in two thousand eight in Scotland, and I was invited to be in a performance art festival. Um, but it was at a time when. Um, the U.S. was was in a pretty aggressive state with regard to our war, the war in the Middle East, and uh, Americans weren't seen all that positively abroad. And um, 
I was interested in my in trying to use my art as like an ambassador uh, to use my art as a way to as a as a means of cultural exchange um, and to maybe get to know people. And so I roamed around the streets of Glasgow wearing only an American flag and carrying a stack of um, DVDs of my video artworks. And I, I was, my goal was to trade my art for clothing until I had an entire outfit. We can go to the next image, please. Um, and I did it. It took about three hours and I, and I got a lot of hostile response in some cases and then a lot of really positive response in other cases. I went door to door. Uh, asking people to give me clothing in exchange for my artwork. It was totally humiliating. <laughs> uh, this one guy that I ran into on the street was, um, I think he was probably a heroin addict. Oh, it, it was humiliating a little bit. Yeah, people gave me, people gave me clothing, but, all, but they also, a lot of people slammed the door in my face. Some people, there were um, some some young boys who were throwing rocks at me. I think because of the American flag, like so that was really intense. Um, there was one woman who was uh, kind of a young mother uh, in her apartment, and she just she didn't trust. She clearly didn't trust me at all, um, and kept looking at me very suspiciously. And she was holding her child in her arms, and like she was. Uh, Fearful. Like, I think she just didn't want to let a stranger into her house, which I understand. Um, but I was, I was interested in this, like, even, like, women not trusting women, and, um, I, which I didn't, I didn't necessarily expect. But on the other hand, there were really positive responses. So one woman uh, was so excited that she invited me in and went through her entire closet and let me pick whatever I wanted from her closet, and she was just ecstatic. Uh, and then another another guy was sitting on his on his front steps um, and had been watching me go down the street and I wasn't going to approach him but because I had seen him watching me for so long I went up to him and I explained to him what I was doing and uh, turns out he was um, he worked in one of the one of the a, a mine uh, a coal mine outside of Glasgow like a super old school kind of hardcore labor worker and yeah and and he said you know I don't I don't really understand what you're doing as art but but I get but I it sounds interesting to me and I think my mother would have understood this she really liked art and um, hold on a minute and he went into his house and he came out with his mother's so his mother had passed away and he came out with his mother's sweater and gave me his, his sweater um, which I still have. So there was just these really incredible things. Yeah, these really incredible things, like acts of generosity that happened. And um, I love when art can be a story, when it can lead to these kind of stories of people's lives, this exchange of personal experience. Um, next slide, please. I also began at the same festival I did a performance I did a series of performance exchanges because I was tired of being invited as a performance artist um, to provide entertainment which happens a lot I think when you're a female performance artist uh, and especially if you're working in female collectives so I I decided that I wasn't going to give away my performances for free anymore, that people would have to barter with me with their own performance. Um, we can go for the next five slides in sequence. Uh, so I did a performance exchange, and this piece is called uh, The Kindness of Strangers. And um, I, I, would, I put a menu on the wall of all the individual performances that I was willing to do for people, and they were all performances that were meant to encourage intimacy. Um, not romantic or sexual intimacy, but just person, personal, just person-to-person -person intimacy. And so there were things like I would hold their hand for five minutes, or I would give them a back rub, or I would cuddle with them, or I would tell them a secret. Um, but I asked that for whichever performance people wanted me to do for them, 
they would have to provide something in exchange and it, and it had to be uh, a performance or an action of some sort and that piece was one of the most incredible pieces I've ever done because people, they, they, the things that they did in exchange were just mind blowing. So like they would sing me a song or they would provide a dance or uh, one person wanted to synchronize his heartbeat with mine and, and he, we laid on top of each other with our hearts, um, like our hearts next to it, like heart to heart and and waited until we felt like they were synchronized and again it wasn't a sexual thing at all his girlfriend was there watching but he we we had to figure out what it would mean to synchronize heartbeats with a stranger and how to do it um so and we did it i think it took a while but we did it so you you guys i think i was gonna stop there and maybe answer questions vanessa if you want to jump if you want to just kind of go through i i provided the unicorn essay the photo essay of my unicorn story if you want to just have those running while people if people have any questions um it's strange not to be able to see faces or um to give my own expressions but thank you so much for listening and for coming everyone i really really appreciate it and would love to hear any questions or feedback you might have i know i am seeing faces you're right and i'm watching people sit and come in and i'm really excited about that i'm just learning i'm learning a new i'm learning a new language today <laughs> and, I, and i'm so grateful to be uh to be hosted Yes, the faces you choose. I love it. Love it. Love it. Oh, so the Facebook residency was a project created by a local artist. Should I type my responses instead for these for the questions? Can you hear me okay or do you want me to Okay. Um the the Facebook residency was where um a curator had a Facebook page, her own Facebook page, and she invited people to take over her page one month at a time. The name stayed the same, but the, the author of the page was different for each, um, for each month. So, uh, and everybody decided to do different things with it, and some of them were really conceptual, and some of them were literal yeah it was a really cool project her name is Chloe Flores I'll write it here um, so you can look her up I don't I haven't looked on her page in a while the, the project ended a year or so ago bye Calliope thank you for coming Uh, the image that's on screen right now is a, um, or it's coming on screen, is a digital pasty that I created because I was so sick of women's breasts being uh, being censored. Bye, Savina. Thank you. And so I, I made a pasty of a male nipple that you could put over digital images. Uh, so, uh, it, it was sort of a tongue-in-cheek response to the sexism of censorship online. And that went viral. It was really funny. I didn't expect it, but it went viral. So yeah, you can put a male nipple over any nipples and like theoretically it should be fine. And then the images that are coming up now is a photo essay that I did about um, a story, a love story with a unicorn. And I was using the unicorn as a symbol of, um, of the patriarchy. And... Um, so it's about me kind of trying to seduce uh, to seduce the unicorn and have my way with it. And basically after I fuck it and uh, get satisfied, I, I then dump it and have an affair with a black stallion. And then I end up killing the unicorn which was meant to be sort of this uh, a metaphor for slaying the patriarchy. Uh, 
I know. It was it was part of a series of works where I was looking at kind of cultural mythology and in particular cultural mythologies about patriarchal power structure and um, wanting to insert myself in a, in a position of agency. And also kind of doing away with the like romantic little girl unicorn obsession because they think that like I think patriarchy works that like works in a similar way where it's like we're seduced into thinking that that's what we should all want and it's this um, sort of e evasive and unrealistic goal getting the unicorn for example so I wanted to demythologize that of course, it also came from this, this, there was a little bit of wish fulfillment wanting to happen, like to be able to realize myself kind of riding a unicorn or making out with a unicorn. <laughs> oh, yes, please. I can, that's a good idea. Is that working? There we go. <laughs> So in the in the unicorn seduction of like I have to find it because of course unicorns are only they only appear to virgins right like it's they uh, and and theory and they live forever and um, they only appear to like the the pure so as you're going through the photo essay you you see my outfits change symbolically as well so I start out in the photo essay and all the colors are like bright and colorful and feminine and I'm in white dresses these sort of virginal white dresses. And, uh, and as it progresses, my clothing changes and the colors of the photo as they change. So here I am, like, I've found the unicorn. I'm trying, I'm sort of seducing it a little bit. I'm offering it some flowers. I'm, like, trying to take it out on a date. And then we, like, we get to know each other a little bit. So here we are kind of walking down the road with the path, like, the future is ahead of us. And, uh... You know just to kind of out on a date and then we start like having this romance so like I'm I'm reading him poetry and there's actually a there's actually one where I'm blowing him bubbles and uh, and then things things start to get a little more intimate and sexy and um, it was really fun yeah I said well hold on let me write didn't talk about memorial thank you so much yeah I, I'm I'm also <laughs> thank you laser skier I'm I'm really I'm happy to answer questions about the videos um, the memorial video was a project that I did for an exhibition curated by John Baldessari and it was an exhibition called 100 artists see God and when um, when I was thinking about that premise, I I thought, well, theoretically, the only time you see God is when you die, or when you have like an epiphany. Um, I'm not a religious person, uh, so I was thinking about like, well, I would have to die in order to see God. Um, and then I was thinking about how artists often become more, uh, more popular after they die like your work it becomes more valuable after you die and so I made this I kind of I made my own memorial video for this exhibition um, in in which all of my closest friends are talking about me as if I'm dead 
Uh, and, and so that video went into the exhibition, 100 Artists See God. Um, and, and the crazy thing was that, uh, the exhibition was at a mu it, it traveled around the world for two years, and the exhibition was at one museum in San Francisco. And someone wanted to invite me to give a talk, and they contacted the museum to get a hold of me. And the the curator at that museum responded to the to her saying, "I'm so sorry, but she's passed on." Like they actually really thought that I had died, <laughs> so so I didn't get to do the lecture because the piece was convincing enough. Um, no, I never, ever, ever hurt animals. I am incredibly sensitive to animals uh, in, in my work. So um, that, that unicorn was the horse of a friend of mine. Her name was Jasmine. Um, and uh, I, it took 75 pounds of carrots to get her to do what we needed her to do in the photo shoot. And... Um, he developed this really incredible bond so that every day that I left the ranch, Jasmine would like run after me, whinnying, um, not wanting me to leave. It was really kind of uncanny. It was kind of, it was a pretty magical experience. Yes, I was the carrot lady. <laughs> I was just, um, I, uh, I'm very new to virtual art. I'm loving it so far. I am so excited to learn more. Um, I haven't planned any projects in um in second life yet but i can like I, I i'm so grateful for the invitation to speak because now i i i'm getting a glimpse about what the possibilities are and i've already been like writing to friends of mine about how excited i am at the possibilities uh but and i don't know yet so i don't know yet uh i would love to do do something in second life uh, i don't know what it is it would probably be some sort of extension of my current feminist work um and, and i like my brain is exploding today thinking about all the possibilities to be honest so i would love it if if anyone who's interested wants to like stay in touch or give me ideas or if you have projects that i can collaborate on or anything by all means i would love it Vanessa, what does that mean when you fall? Oh, I love it. I know it's great. I wasn't sure. Um, I, I, I was, I was thinking about it when giving this talk, and I realized I didn't know how to make my my seahorse fall, but I did a falling performance, um, which is similar to the to a little bit similar to the ideas about gifting, is that I frequently will fall been giving a, a, a public performance um, and I, I fall on purpose but people usually think it's an accident but what it's sort of a slapstick strategy um, and uh, when you fall like people people see you as fallible and human and they have empathy for you and they have compassion and you're no longer in this like snobby hierarchical place so I do have these sort of surprise falling performances that I do um, Facebook is the best place to follow me. I have a website, but it's it's pretty badly designed and usually out of date. I'm I'm pretty active on Facebook though. That's kind of my. I know it's a little. Facebook is also a little bit out of date, but Facebook. I have an Instagram account that I'm kind of slow at, but I do put stuff on there. But all of my projects really happen on Facebook right now. Um, so you can follow me on Facebook and then there's the situation room. My project space has a Facebook page and, um, and my gallery tally has a Facebook page and I have my own Facebook page. So all of those are good places to follow me. That's the most up to date place to follow me. Oh, so you see now my outfit is totally different in the unicorn image. I've taken on like the power outfit. I'm wearing like a blazer and jeans and here we are having our breakup fight because the unicorn has seen me cheating on him with a black stallion. Um, yeah. So that's it, guys. Oh, thank you, Vanessa.
Um, do you, those of you who are still here, where, what do you recommend I check out in Second Life? Do you have work around? Oh, I know of a, pro a project that's coming up that I'm working on is, uh, that I'll be working on next year is, um, it's an app designed for, uh, it's a travel app or a road, it's a road trip app for the states uh, in particular, where I'm trying to remap feminist histories uh, across the United States. So it would be a geo locative app that you would sign into when you're when you're driving across country or across a state or whatever and um and it would tell you stories about women who were working in the area that they that you're driving through so you would hear about um female pioneers or business centers or matriarchs or whatever and it's also a wiki, so people can contribute stories of their own uh, female kind of family members or heroines who are from that area. So that's my next year. I'll be driving all over the states for about six months, collecting stories and mapping them out uh, to to plug into the app. Yeah. Thanks. And then this last image is the sad assassination photo of me shooting the patriarchy. Um, so I, I'm going to sign off because I now have to get ready for an opening at the Situation Room, but I cannot thank you enough for listening and coming, and I, and I hope that you will find me online or stay in touch, and I hope to see you here again sometime soon.